All right, so my name is Brad Richardson. Uh, I work with Damien, who was the keynote speaker at Archaeologic. Uh, there's my website and all of my contact information. So if, uh, if you want to bug me about this stuff later, uh, you, you can find me there. I've uh, been doing Fortran software development in the nuclear industry for over a decade. My master's degree is in nuclear engineering, and then straight out of college, I was thrown into a legacy code base, and I've been I've been doing that kind of stuff ever since. Uh, I've I've spent a significant amount of time focused on quality assurance and specifically software quality assurance. So a lot of this is kind of motivated by that idea. There are a lot of very stringent requirements in the nuclear industry with regards to quality assurance and, and software quality assurance. So uh, uh, that, that's kind of where, where some of this motivation comes from. So let's start talking about what are software tests? Uh, a software test is a set of operations that it will perform, be performed on a software system for the purposes of verifying its behavior. Basically, the idea is we're just going to kind of poke around at the code and make sure it's doing what we expect. Uh, you could do this manually, and oftentimes people do, right? A lot of, there are a lot of Fortran science and engineering programs that are developed this way. The developer writes a big old, a big old piece of code and put it in a program. They feed it input files and look at the outputs and go, okay, I think it's, I think it's doing what I meant. Um, and, and that works to some degree, but it's not necessarily scalable. So what is it that we actually want? Well, what we'd like to have are automated tests. So what are the automated tests? Well, I'm going to make an assertion that the automated tests are a set of claims made in a sufficiently structured format that a computer can verify them, right? So the, the idea here is that we can write what we want our code to do in such a way that the computer can automatically verify that the code does in fact do those, do those things. And generally, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get your uh, results from running those tests in a slightly more convenient format than just a set of red and green lights, but, but that's the basic idea. Is there some button we can push somewhere that's going to give us a go or no go does my program work kind of in square, scare quotes there so but what makes for a good test my assertion is that you should write your tests for the people who are going to be trying to understand the code that it is testing you should specify what does the it works mean. So this is the key point of the talk here is that if you want your tests to be helpful to anyone else later, they must do more than just test the functionality. They need to clearly express the expected behavior to the reader of the test. You should be able to, from execution of your test suite tell what it is that the the author of this code and the tests really expected from the code that is being tested right it if you've got uh, if you've got this uh, mouse trap going around i have to be able to understand the purpose of that right what if, if i see this interesting contraption why is it there why why is it doing what it does and so I, I actually, uh, I kind of classify my, my different kinds of tests into, into do two different categories. I call them behavior-based and property-based. And so behavior-based is generally something you're gonna do with something like on the left-hand side. If we've got this mouse trap contraption, uh, we wanna test it to the extent that we can, kind of isolating the different pieces. Uh, and we wanna say how, how does it do what it does? So what are the sequence of calls that should be made? What are the inputs and what are the outputs? And what is it supposed to do? So like in what scenario I do what kinds of things? And then I expect what kind, what kind of outcome at the, at the outset. And then on the right-hand side, we, get, we have these property-based. And that's given some state of the world, any input or state that matches some criterion, 
there is some operation that can be performed. What is it that is always going to be true when we perform that operation? So the, the, these are the fundamental properties of the code that I expect out of its behavior. And so let's start to take a look at some examples. Um, these next few examples are direct, taken directly from the test suite for vegetables, and they are written using vegetables. And it's not that you couldn't write tests like this in another framework, or even without a framework, but vegetables has been designed specifically to facilitate and encourage writing your tests in this style. Uh, notice that we have this kind of direct correspondence to that breakdown that I just explained for a behavior test. In what scenario, so that, that first description here, in what scenario, I do what thing and I expect what outcome. This is where we're starting to write these things in this kind of specification style. We're specifying what the, what the expected behavior of this piece of code is supposed to be. And we kind of also still have this correspondence. It's a little bit more difficult to see if you're not immediately, uh, if you it's not immediately obvious if you're kind of brand new to the framework, but we also have this reasonable correspondence between what the specification says and what the tests are doing, right? So a passing test case, right? So what are the inputs for this, for this scenario, right? So I can specify those inputs here. Uh, what are the sequence of calls, right? So wh what is it that we're performing ba based on those inputs? And then what is the expected output? And now the, this example is using a lot of the advanced features of, of the vegetables testing framework. And, and so won't necessarily be immediately obvious, but here in a minute, we'll, we'll go over some, uh, a, a little bit simpler example. Um, but, but next I wanna talk about the, the property test. So how, how are these kind of organized is uh, very similar uh, that we, we still have this correspondence uh, of given some input or state to the, of the world. Uh, what is it that we, what is some, the, the operation that can be performed and then what is always going to be true when we perform that operation. Uh, meaningful property tests can be a bit harder to devise, but the, the mechanics end up looking quite similar. So, and, and in this example, we kind of, it's required that we know the answer based on the input, right? We have to, we have to contrive some input and some expected answer in this case, right? I, I can't just generate some random, some random test case or collection. I mean, in theory we could, but that's probably more, more work than it's worth in this kind of case. Um, but there is some more advanced ideas and there are some cases where you actually can do something like this. For, for example, uh, the associativity of addition. Given three numbers, A plus B plus C, it shouldn't matter whether I add A plus B first or B plus C first, right? The addition is associative and so I should get the same answer with, uh, in either order of operations. And so that would be the kind of a property test that you might be able to write. Um, and so those, those were some pretty complicated examples. So let's take a look at a simpler example to motivate some of the tests that we might want to write. Let's say we need to be able to tell whether a year is a leap year or not for some reason, right? This is some aspect of, of, our, of our project that we're gonna need to, to consider. You might write a function like this. This one is very simple. And some of you are probably already jumping up and down and screaming, I see a problem, but don't ruin the surprise for the rest of us. Uh, so let's look at what a test you might write for this might look like. And, and I, and I title this one, the ugly, right? If, if your only goal is just that, you know, your manager said, hey, you need to write some unit tests. And you go, okay, fine. All right, I'll, I'll write something that does a test, right? And to an extent, this is actually testing the code, right? We are calling the function down here at the bottom, right? We, we are calling our is you leap your function. We are passing it some inputs and we're checking something about the answer it gives back. 
but what does this tell us about how the code is supposed to work? What happens when we run these tests? Uh, we don't really get all that much meaningful information back out of running the test suite. I see what you're testing, but what does the it works mean? And I just, just mentioned there is probably something wrong with the code that we're testing, and this hasn't caught it, right? What's, and, and we're not really using meaningful inputs to do this test either, right? We're just passing the numbers one and four, but these are supposed to be years. Those aren't really years. And so this is the kind of thing that I see occasionally from people who are brand new to unit testing, uh, brand new to the idea of this, of this kind of testing. But we can do better. And so the next example, we're still testing the same code. And this is slightly better. I still label this bad. And not that it's terrible. It's certainly better than the previous example we looked at, you know, head and shoulders above that. Um, you can see that we're using years as the inputs now. And we've organized the test around the two possible outputs, right? We have some better organization and a little bit more description. But why are the years that we've provided leap year? Right? The check is leap year, check leap year, right? Why are these years leap years? And why aren't these years leap years? When we run these tests, we see we do get one of our one of our tests to fail now, but why is that one failing? What is it about that year that is causing our our code to fail? Yeah, so this this is better. We're now catching the problem with our code, but we but it's not really helping us to shine a light directly on what is the aspect of our code that is broken. And so now we'll move on to what, what would a good test suite look like? And, and at this point, I've managed to trim it down to where I don't really even need to show you the functions that are actually doing the checking, right? Now we have a specification with all the important aspects about how the is leap year function is supposed to work, right? And when we run this, it's now immediately obvious what aspect of our code is broken, right? We're supposed to be saying that for years that are divisible by 100, but not, but not 400, that that's not supposed to be a leap year. That's exactly the specification that we have not have failed to meet about what this function is supposed to do. And given the framework we're, that we're using, uh, we can actually get a little bit fancier with it. Uh, we can pull those example inputs uh, up closer to our specification. And so now all of the important bits about what is this code supposed to do? What is our requirement specification for this function? What are all of the important bits about what we're trying to say when we say that we want to test this code, right? We can pull the, we can say that these years are not a leap year because they're not divisible by four. And so the function that we're trying to test should satisfy that requirement. And, and similarly for, for, the following, uh, for the following cases, right? And so I'll, I'll leave you with some of the additional, some additional resource sources. Uh, a lot of the inspiration for the examples that I've, that I've uh, shown here were taken from a talk by Kevlin Henney that he titled uh, Structure and Interpretation of Test Cases, uh, which was a very, very interesting talk. And you can find that on YouTube at, at that location. Um, also the book by Roy Oshiro, The Art of Unit Testing. Uh, I, I have uh, based a lot of my techniques and, and practices on a lot of the ideas in that book. Uh, you can of course find the vegetable source code there on GitLab. Uh, I have just completed the, uh, the basics uh, for a tutorial uh, that you can find in the documentation there. I've been spending a lot of time helping to try and improve the documentation there over the last several weeks. And I, I intend to keep, uh, keep working on that tutorial and hopefully, uh, hopefully showing how to use a lot of the more advanced features of, of 
vegetables and some more advanced techniques for, for uh, writing these kinds of tests. Um, you can also reach me at my email there or uh, I'm on the Fortran Lang discourse uh, on a pretty regular basis. So feel free to reach out with questions and comments. Um, and the slides and the code will for this talk will be made available at the uh, Fortran Lang Talks repository. So you'll be able to get the slides and all of that stuff from there as well. Um, so that is that concludes my talk and I managed to speed right through that. So we have lots of time for questions. So give me one second and I will pull up the uh, Slack channel, the Slack here and see if I can't address some of the questions that you all have been asking. Well, if, uh, if, thank you, if anyone uh, wants to just leap in with a question in person, pop your yeah. hand up. Yeah, go ahead uh, in, and, the, uh, in the Zoom call. Yeah, go ahead with that as well. Uh, so the first one here, does Vegetable support running tests in parallel? So as written currently, Vegetable supports running tests on parallel code, tests that you that use co-arrays. It does not run the tests themselves in parallel. And there, there's a there's a tricky distinction there because uh, if if a piece of code uses co-arrays, then all of the images have to call that test in the same order, right? So because there's going to be communication there, and the images have to reach those those points at, at the same at the same order uh, to to do those tests. So so right now, vegetables test vegetables supports testing parallel code, not necessarily running the tests in parallel. So that there's an interesting distinction there. Um, uh, where can we find the vegetables tutorial? Uh, there's a link for documentation, but I, I will drop you a link right there to, as a response to that question there on the Slack as well. Uh, there are quite a few Fortran related testing frameworks out there with very different styles and objectives. Is that a good thing or should we try and combine forces? Is that is, if that is at all possible, of course. Um, they all kind of take different approaches. I wanted to take an all Fortran approach. That was one thing that I that I didn't quite like about a lot of the uh, the the Fortran testing frameworks out there was that they seem to it require additional dependencies for generating your test suite or gluing the whole thing together, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I wanted to try and take an all an all Fortran approach to this. And I, I wanted to have a different style for the output and, and the way that the tests were executed as well. So, so I took a different approach. Uh, there's nothing to say that uh, other frameworks don't have a valid approach or even a good approach in some cases. Uh, but what I really do like out of, a, what I really do want out of a testing framework is the ability to write tests in this kind of a style and have my test suite be the kind of thing that really gives a developer this level of detail. The idea being kind of the idea being here that if I had nothing but your test suite, could I recreate your, your project? Could, could I re-implement your project and get it to work the same using just your test suite alone? Uh, that that is where a really valuable long term long term valuable test suite uh, comes into play is it, it if I can just run your test suite and, and know exactly what your code is supposed to do and could re implement it from scratch that then that's super valuable especially for onboarding new developers uh, we've had good success using C test as the test harness. Is there a good reason to have the driver be a program that calls functions rather than an external system that calls test programs? Uh, there's pros and cons to that. Um, C test is C test is valuable. I I have used it as well. Um, it, the the downside to having all of your tests in a single executable is that if one of them crashes, all of them crash. The, the upside is that there's a lot more that you can do at runtime in terms of selection of which tests, although the external testing system can do that as well. It, 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 there are trade-offs. Um, let's see. Is there anything 
else that's uh, really just itching for, for one last uh, one last question? Huh, you have another one on Slack? Oh, is vegetables an FPM package? Yes, yes it is. So you can just drop that into your fpm.toml file and be off to the races. So I think that looks like we are about out of time for questions. Uh, I will be poking around on Slack to answer any more that you have. So don't hesitate to ask questions there. <laughs>